from all the equipment. So things like displays, switches, DSPs, which do all the audio, um, the video conferencing, um, TV decoders, um, lighting, HVAC, um, security systems, um, basically anything that has any form of API or what we used to call, to call control protocols, um, you can then control from these systems. So you can have um, a button on the touch panel that says go to cinema mode and it turns all the lights off, it turns the air conditioning down a bit so you're not getting all the fan noise, turns the sound system on, turns the projector on, closes the blinds, all that sort of stuff. Um, now the protocols can go over lots of different transports. Um, originally there was like little RF clickers where it would have a little clicker in your hand, talk to a little RF box and it would make a slide go on. Um, that's progressed so you now have like the infrared controls um, which are obviously just one way. Then there was RS-232, which is a two-way single drop protocol. So you have a transmitter and receive, and there's two lines, transmit line, receive line. Um, RS-485, which is more of a balanced multi-drop. So you can have one box talking to multiple different boxes and the send and receive is over a single. Um, and then we've obviously moved into the IP world now, um, things like Telnet, SSH, and um, non-standard ports and their own protocols. Um, so it's basically anything that has some form of control, you can control from these systems. Um, so how long has this been going on? Um, well, Crestron was founded in 1972. That's one of the main ones. AMX um, is another main one. That was 1982. Uh, found out today Kramer, which is another one. They were formed in about the early 1980s. So this has go, been going on for over 40 years. Um, obviously starting off with, uh, like, like shown there, the carousel controllers. Um, I think what happened at Crestron was he got really annoyed with having to do presentations using a wired remote, it limited him. Um, so he developed, uh, he took a garage door controller basically, which was an RF way of making a thing advance and used it to control a, a, a carousel slide projector. Um, so from the Crestron, Crestron and AMX were two of the main ones. AMX seems to be dying out at the moment. I'm seeing a lot less of it around. Um, although they are still around, they have just been bought by Samsung. So Samsung have been including it um, in a lot of their um, displays and end user equipment, directly talking to AMX stuff. Um, but Samsung mostly bought AMX because AMX was part of Harman and Harman had a big in-car um, world that Samsung wanted to get into. So AMX has sort of fallen by the wayside a little bit at the moment. And Crestron have sort of stormed ahead and, and they're the market leaders at the moment. Um, but Crestron develop all of their hardware in-house. They've got all their R&D, mainly in New Jersey. Um, AMX in the past have tended to, um, instead of developing their own, say, audio visual switcher, they've gone out and bought an audio visual switcher company and then integrated that into their ecosystems. Um, AV control stroke equipment manufacturers have tended to be all about the ecosystem. So they want you to have their um, touch panels, their, their controllers, their video switches, their DSPs. Um, so you have like a rack full of equipment with their name on it. Um, a lot of AV companies didn't used to do that. They used to take the switcher from one company, the controller from another, the DSP from another, and that's where a lot of the control systems actually sit, where they can take all those different um, hardware manufacturers and you can control them all from one place. You don't need all the different controllers. Um, where 
what markets it covered by this? Well, there's there's two main ones. First one's commercial. Um, this is like mainly meeting rooms, boardrooms, um, lecture theatres and stadiums. Um, you can see all the list there. Basically, anywhere where there's lots of audiovisual kit that needs to be controlled. It could be that it's all scattered all over. It's like I did um, Epsom Racecourse and they had several hundred TVs scattered out throughout all their buildings and they needed somewhere they could just switch them all on and off from one place. So you have a touch panel and it basically says switch all the TVs off on this floor, all off on this floor, switch all of our TVs off. Nice big button that says switch all of our TVs off. Um, what you see there was actually for McAfee, the antivirus people. Um, that's their executive briefing centre in Amsterdam. That's where they take um, executives from their client companies to show them how their software de defends their networks and computers from attacks. Um, and you can see behind their um, table that's several LCD screens laid flat with a multi-touch overlay um, that run special software. Uh, but this is all controlled with the Crestron control system. I spent two weeks out there programming it. Um, and the glass on that server room behind can go opaque. And they've got some projectors that rear project onto it so they can display some graphics on there as well. Um, sometimes this, this project was um, awesome and different. Um, it was really nice and interesting to do. Um, a lot of the time it is just cookie cutter meeting rooms. Uh, you've got a telly on the wall, you've got a laptop point on the table, make it work. Um, but sometimes you get some interesting projects where um, you get to play with nice things, nice things like that. Um, military is another one that's quite interesting going on to military bases. Um, I went in the hangar where BAE systems service the tornadoes. Um, and uh, BAE systems around the country where, you know, you'd be walking down and there'd be a tank on the side of the road and um, but you go into the meeting room and it'll just be a normal meeting room with a projector and a touch panel on the table. Uh, so sometimes it's not the actual room, it's the, the atmosphere around it. There's, um, there's quite a lot of travelling with this. Um, the other main um, market is the residential market. Um, it's mainly houses. I've split off home theatre for this because home theatre um, is sort of a discipline in its own right. Um, and also yachts. You don't think of it, but the big yachts have bedrooms, living rooms, home theatres. And so they need control systems as well. Now the yachts market is very specialised. There's a bit more involved with the programming side. Um, of course, you have to deal with, not necessarily from the programmer point of view, but all the ship systems and the power systems. Um, it's, you need to be a bit more robust with the programming on that side. Um, I'd also say that programming for houses is very, very different to the commercial world. Commercial world is very go in, bang the touch panel in, walk out, you're done, you don't go back unless you know, they're changing something. With houses, it tends to be a bit more of a relationship. The programming is very different um, in that you have to um, got distracted by the chat. Um, you have to think very differently to the commercial world. Um, you tend to have some more global control. So the owner of the house wants to be able to walk around and control any room in the house from his iPad or his phone. Um, he also wants to be able to lock the kids out of certain sources. There's all there's all those different things that were really involved with the with the residential market, and of course, if your um, if your client's TV isn't working at two o'clock on a Saturday morning, 
when he wants to watch a film, you are going to get a phone call and he expects you to answer. These people are multi-millionaires and occasionally billionaires. I've met a few of them and been to their houses. And it is very, very different. Uh, it's, um, it's pretty good fun. Yeah, Cedia. Cedia are the um, the residential. The um, Avixa is the commercial world organisation. That's more of a global one. Um, Cedia is still global, um, but they have more UK biased group and a US biased group, and um, they tend to be more broken up into regions than Avixa are. They're the industry bodies that tend to deal with the overall side of things. Um, this wasn't a theatre I did, it was somebody else, but um, they're the sort of things you get with people who have many, many millions of pounds. Um, so, moving on, that's the market. Manufacturers and their IDEs. Now, the, um, the programming side of this tends to be locked down to a particular IDE. So the manufacturer, this is Crestron's, um, they supply the software that you use to program their systems. Now over on the right you see on the top that's the UI development. It is very much a what you see is what you get um, UI developing tool. There's not like HTML where you have to code it all um, you can drag all these elements in, adjust them to how you like, um, and then you give them numbers. That's what the little blue and red things are. Um, they're the numbers that then get transmitted to the control system side, where you then can do with those signals what you wish. So you see down the bottom, um, that's Crestron's way of doing it. It is very sort of engineering biased in that you connect blocks together. Um, you can see you've got a toggle there, interlock, so you have multiple inputs, but only one output will be high. Um, you see it's not particularly code related. It is more dragging blocks, connecting them together. Um, and knowing how all this hangs together. And I'm, I'm in, I spent 12 years as a freelancer doing this. Um, it does take a lot of learning to actually get into it. Um, it is re really easy to pull together a quick system in this, but when you get to the more complex stuff, it becomes more difficult. The nice thing is you can drag little modules in, which other people have written, and you just hook up these little signals and it does all the hard work for you. So it's quite a nice low level of entry for those people um, who haven't really done any computer programming before, which is what most of the people who come into this industry, they don't come from the computer programming world, they come from the AV install world and they're connecting boxes together with signals which they're used to from circuit diagram or diagrams for how they hook up the audio visual systems themselves. So the bottom one is the simple windows, the top one is the vision tools. Pro E, Wizzy with UI. Um, I haven't shown here is the simple plus. Simple plus is sort of a C look, feel, language, um, which lets you do a bit more complicated stuff than you see in um, the simple windows programming. Um, they also do have a C sharp implementation at this level. Um, it is locked down to .NET Framework 3.5, which means you need Visual Studio 2008. It won't work on anything newer because um, it's, it's all built into their sandbox. They don't want you mucking around with their processes. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. Um, they also have um, a wizard style programming called Crestron Studio. Um, which you can build simple systems out of, um, but not a lot of people use it because it's broken. Uh, 
Um, they also do what's called Home OS 3, which is very much a configuration based system that you can't really program. Um, but it's very simple for people to hook together the ecosystem of products and get a system up and running really quickly. Um, all of this is only available for authorised programmers and authorised dealers. Um, sadly, they lock away everything so that normal people can't go and play with it. Um, yeah, <laughs> but everybody's like that in this world. Um, nice thing is Crestron are slowly opening up. Um, what do you see a tattoo on your forehead there? Is that the Crestron logo? Just, uh, just Sorry, what? Sorry, it's a really bad joke. I said, I thought oh, I could see a tattoo on your forehead. Is it the Crestron? <laughs> I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I think it says authorised programmer. <laughs> yeah. um, I've just been on, actually just been doing this week, what they call Crestron Masters, where all the authorised programmers from around the world get together and, and get training on all the new systems and um, get to chat to each other. It's been, been really nice. Normally we gather in... Um, well, it has been in Connecticut and Madrid. They were supposed to be in Orlando this year, but they um, obviously haven't been able to do it. And I was going to go to Madrid a few weeks ago. And um, it's more, it's always been a case of um, the networking side of it, getting to meet the engineers, talking to all the other programmers, because you don't get to talk to other Crestron programmers normally. Um, that's made the fun of that. Um, but we haven't been able to do that this year, unfortunately. Anyway, moving on to AMX. Uh, like I say, AMX were Crestron's main competitor. Um, they do seem to be dying off a bit. Um, I don't know if you can see down the bottom, that's their code. It is sort of C-ish. Um, And then the top is a uh, again a WYSIWYG style um, drag a button onto a page and make it look how you want. Um, give it a number and then that touch panel talks to the processor using AMX's own little communications protocol. Um, AMX.com it is free to download now ever since Harman bought them. Um, they seem to have removed any need to log in to download their software. Um, they also have a load of online training available. Um, some of it is not specific to AMX. Some of it's very much a, an industry training. So that might be quite a nice one to have a look at if you want to have a play. Um, the AMX distributor for the UK is actually based in DIS, so not far away. Um, although you do still have to be some form of dealer to buy the kit from um, the distributor. Um, I get the feeling you still need to be authorised to actually program a system completely at the moment, but like I say, the software seems to be free to download. They sort of removed the gatekeeper on it. So it's quite an interesting one to have a look at um, if you want to try and get into this world. Um, QSC, this is a very, very interesting one. Um, again, it's free to download. They've got online training videos. Um, the programming's done it as Lua, but they also have a front on it that looks a lot like Scratch. Don't know if you can see just over here, they've got um, some of their control programming and it's built very much like Scratch. Um, and again, they've got the WYSIWYG style um, touch panel designer software um, that's all built into their designer software. Um, but I believe in the back of that, it's actually HTML and CSS, although it might just be the CSS bit that you can modify. Again, it's locked down to their ecosystem. You have to use their software to program it. Um, the nice thing about this is it runs on a server. So the actual QSC servers are Intel servers. 
um, and they have an emulation mode which allows you to run it on your laptop. So you can actually build the software and run it on your laptop as well. The downside, you need to know DSP audio systems programming to work with it because the main thing it does is the DSP side. So it is the audio processor. They, they seem to have built the control system on top of the DSP rather than it being a separate appliance that you run. Um, it is very interesting, very up and coming. Lots of people are using it. Um, these are the sort of systems that go into stadiums. A lot of the big stadiums use QSC systems to run their audio. Um, if you have a look at their website, they've got a load of um, case studies and things on there. Um, very interesting system indeed. I'll say you can have a look at it. Um, Extron, now they've been around for donkey's years, um, mainly as um, audio visual switch matrix switches and um, distribution um, manufacturer. Um, they got into control systems a few years ago. Um, they are very locked down. You do have to have a login to get their, um, get their IDEs. Um, global configurator, it's mainly built in. Um, a lot of the programming you put behind the button. So you build the UI, put the programming behind the button, um, there's still a controller and a separate UI a touch panel. Um, so there's still the touch panel talking to the processor, but it's managed a slightly different way to other people. Um, a few years ago, they um, created their, what they call Global Scripter, and that runs Python. So if you're a Python programmer and want to go into the audio visual world, maybe have a look at Extron, have a chat with them, see if you can become one of their programmers. Um, or a, a freelance programmer working on those systems. There's not a lot of people around in the UK who are certified for Extron Global Scripter. So um, it's one of the things to have a look at. Um, I've bundled these together because they're not particularly interesting. Control 4 is very locked down. Um, you even even if you are certified you have to log in every so often otherwise you lose it um, they are mainly for residential um, if you remember me saying about crestron's home os3 that's what crestron's home os3 is competing with um, they're very locked down they're not particularly um, friendly for changing the uis um, it's very fixed. It's more of a configurable system than programmable. Um, Kramer, they are again, they're a bit like Extron. They've very much been in the audiovisual equipment, um, mainly matrix switching world. Um, they've just developed a new control system that's cloud based, but it's drag and drop configuration again. It's not really programmable. Um, and then you've got all of the uh, the little remote control ones like RTI, RTI URC and Logitech. Um, if you Google RTI remote, they'll come up and the same with URC. Um, they're very similar in how they're, they're um, and the Logitech Harmony remote. They are more like a universal remote control plus than a full control system. So they have a little box that sits behind a TV um, and converts the RTI into RS-232s and IRs mainly, and a little bit of IP. Um, they are fun to play with. Um, Logitech, you can just go and buy one and program it yourself as an all-in-one remote for your, for your home. RTI, URC, again, you need to be dealer linked to them in order to get their stuff and program it. Um, so moving on to the, uh, the programming side of things it is uh, very much event based programming. So rather than writing little routines that, that do stuff, you're more thinking about, well, when the button, this button gets pushed on the UI, what happens? 
and then you drive the event from that. So on the top bit, you can see the Crestron way of doing things. So this is a little symbol for a TSW 1052, which is Crestron touch panel. Oh, but, um, and so you press button two on the touch panel, it triggers the signal home, home then triggers an all, which gives you the mode page, which then shows the mode page back on the touch panel. Um, so it sort of roots like that. These are all digitals, um, I just bools, I suppose, true and false. Slightly different language. We've got digital analog and serial where you'd normally do bool, U short, and string for the more programming world. And then the, the sort of equivalent, if you like, is the AMX one at the bottom, um, where you get a button event in from the touch panels and then you do stuff with that. It is more code based. Um, and then you see we've got the switch case. So whichever channel's pushed, you can then do some stuff like send some feedback to the panel to say which one you're previewing and then send something off to the switch to say switch to this camera. Um, the other way it can get an event is to get some feedback from the device that you're trying to control. So sometimes somebody might come in and switch the display on with its uh, little button on the bottom. Well, if they do that, what do you want to do? Just route the laptop to it? Things like that. You can trigger lots of different events off stuff you have that come in, like incoming call on the video conference unit. So if somebody dials into the video conference unit, what do you want to do? If the room's off, switch the display on, switch the display to the video conference unit answer the call, unmute the microphones. You can do all that from getting a signal from the video conference unit. Um, there's things like occupancy sensors as well. So if somebody walks into the room, a lot of what you'd be used to may, maybe in, in like uh, big buildings is people walk into rooms and the lights come on. Well, we can use that trigger, we can monitor it, we can turn the display on, set the system up to be, to show say the laptop on the screen first or the PC, or just have like a welcome slide on the screen to say, use the touch panel on the table to control the room. And then what you can have is, if the occupancy sensor gets triggered and you know the room's in use, and there's a meeting scheduled, well the control system can track that meeting as well and automatically dial the video conference unit into the call so the people don't have to touch anything at all which is a nice, interesting way of doing it. But that's what these systems are built for, is to take stuff and make, make it automate. That's the difference between the automation and control. We're controlling all this stuff. Oh, okay. Um, we're controlling all this stuff. Um, yes but the main power of it comes from the automation of all this. Now, a lot of programmers in the past, you come across their systems and they have buttons on the touch panel that say, turn on projector, bring the screen down, switch the switcher to laptop. There are three different buttons. Why not just have a laptop button that turns the projector on, brings the screen down and switches to laptop? That's the difference in thought that you need from the basic control to automation. You know, the homeowner comes home and opens the, the gate to drive up, switch the lights on on the driveway, switch the, unlock the front door, um, turn the lights on in the hallway, start up his favorite music for when he gets home from work. There's all stuff like that you do um, from, you can use from feedback from devices. It's all about being at the, the center of everything with these control systems. Um, you also have global monitoring and control mainly, well, I'm working on one for a residential thing at the moment. Um, it's mainly for the corporate world where they have um, multiple meeting rooms and universities. Universities are very, very um, keen on these sort of things. Now these allow you to monitor 
all of this equipment that we're talking to. So if we're trying to talk to a display and it doesn't respond, we can get an email that says the display is not responding. Now that could be anything. That could just be that the power's gone to the screen. It could be that the, screen, the wire got broken. It could be that somebody's stolen the screen. If it's in the university, somebody's ripped the screen off the wall and run off with it. Um, so they're quite uh, a nice thing to have. They give you false alerts as well. Um, so if there is something, say the video conference camera stops working, you can get a report that tells you that. Um, so the fault alert, um, that can also email you to tell you that that's happened. Um, so you don't have to constantly monitor it. Um, but the fault alerts do show up on a nice page which lets you know what's, what's going on with the rooms and what you need, maybe need to have a look at. Um, but what happens sometimes, you know, I get an email to say the display's offline and when I look at it, it's not. But then it can come back in a bit and then go away again. So the fault alert will let me, um, let me see, give me an overview of what's going on and what, what problems we actually have at that moment. Um, you can also pull reports from these sort of systems. So it tracks when the screens get turned on, when they get turned off, when it's in a video conference call and when it's not. Um, so what you can do, and, and you can track meetings as well. So if they you can log in, you can log it into the schedule for the room and you can see when people have booked meetings and you can use occupancy centers, sensors to say, well, nobody turned up for that meeting. It was booked and nobody turned up or it was booked and they, they turned up and they overran. Um, you can also see um, what equipment they use for the room. So say you've put in a room PC a laptop point, um, a wireless presenter solution where you can just present from a laptop wirelessly without having to plug anything in. Um, you can, the facilities can run a report to say, well, what have they used from the room? And if you find that they're not using the wireless solution, they're always plugging their laptop in. When you roll out 500 new rooms, you don't buy 500 new wireless presenters at a thousand pounds each and you save yourself a lot of money. Um, so there's a lot more going on at the back end of the AV world than, than just, um, just the control from the UI. There's, because you're bundling all this information together in one place, you can do a lot more with it. Um, I am working on a, one of these for a, it's not a residence, it's multiple residences dotted around the world for a billionaire um, where he keeps having problems. He's, he's not in the house for nine, ten months of the year. He's there, there for six weeks and then gone again. And when he rolls up, something doesn't work and nobody knows that it doesn't work. Well, with this system, we're looking at monitoring everything. And then if something does break, people can go and fix it before he shows up. Um, he's got places in, and I've been to most of them, um, Dubai, Phuket, um, and Monaco, and he's building one in the Bahamas at the moment, which I will be going to to program by the looks of it. So you get to go to some exotic places with this and um, meet some interesting people. So changes over the years. From the programming side, we haven't had many. We still have buttons on touch panels that talk to processors. The processors still need to talk to displays and DSPs and video conference codecs. All of that hasn't changed, I'd say, over the last 20 years. Um, the only thing that has changed is instead of IR, it's more RS-232. Instead of RS-232, there's more IP control. So we're moving onto the network. Um, all of the IDEs, AMX1, they haven't changed in over two years, at least. Um, I had a look at AMXs the other day. Their, their IDE 
um, version hasn't changed since I last downloaded it three years ago. Um, Crestrons tends to get updated a bit more often because they're always adding stuff to it. Um, but again, how you do stuff in it hasn't really changed. In the last major update was about 10 years ago when they changed how they do all the graphics, all the, all the UI designs. Um, but most recent changes really has been all about network security. So um, a lot of the stuff moved from RS-232 to IP control, but it was all open telnet, completely clear, no encryption. Um, now people are wanting to move to um, SSH and encrypted connections. And that's, that's currently being done now. Um, I always like to bring up at this point in the conversation, um, I'm going to show hands. You've seen uh, Mr. Robot. Yeah. Have you seen the episode where they take the house over and flash all the lights and turn the sound system on? Yeah. Network security. That house, I could do that with a billionaire's house because I have access to it from outside world, but um, Not yeah. when you do that though. <laughs> <laughs> I get, I'm trusted, so, but I could do that to this guy's houses in Monaco and Dubai and Phuket. It's nothing stopping me doing it. That would make a great live stream. <laughs> but that's completely doable. What happened there, you can do it. Um, I'm sure you promised me you would do that at the end of this. Is that uh, not no. Last ten minutes. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Last ten minutes was trolling. Was trolling uh, this chat, right? <laughs> I am not doing that. Um, but for the equipment side of things, there's been big changes because it's gone from the analog world to the digital world. So, whereas you used to have a VGA connection on the table. It's now an HDMI or a display port or a USB C. Um, that's now just coming out um, mainly HDMI display port lately. Um, and it's gone from having bespoke cables, you'd have to run a VGA cable and audio cable. Now you have a box at the table and a box at the other end, and it's Cat5 in between, Cat5e or Cat6. And it's, it's all gone to being over the structured cable now. Um, so a lot of the, um, one of the last big ones I did, the only on-site cables we had to run the speakers. We had to run speaker wires and that was it. Everything else was done over structured cables. Um, it has been in the past where it's been what they call HD based T, which is their own like protocol that runs audio and video over a Cat5e. Um, and it's then plugged into a matrix switch, which switches that um, internally. Now that runs uncompressed 4K video. So you're talking 30, 40 gig bandwidth over that cable. It's managed in such a way that it actually works. <coughs> But over the last three years, they've been moving to AV over IP. So instead of having a big, big box in the rack that switched all the video and audio and you had to link to it directly, um, now you put a network switch in the rack and you have boxes out in the rooms that take the laptop input, convert it into uh, JPEG 2000, and then it's a, it's a 750 megabit stream on the network um, encrypted of course nobody can tap into it and it can only be decoded by another one of these boxes um, they are also doing the 10 gig versions which run on the 10 gig network switches and that tends to be a lot of them um, very few are doing a one gig solution that can do uh, 4k 30 whatever it is, 444, 
uh, the sort of really higher end one. Um, Crestron are one of the people who can do that one gig stream for AV over IP. Another, another thing that's been changing from the equipment point of view is they're moving everything into the MER, um, the server room. So as companies have been moving all their servers out to data centers, there's a lot more space in the racks in the equipment room for audio visual kit. I like to say they're moving everything onto the network switches. So now a lot of the kit is actually installed into the MER rather than being in a rack in a cupboard in a room that gets all hot and breaks and people can access and take apart and unplug stuff. Um, it's now moving into the secure equipment room and all the end users have is a cable on the table to plug the laptop in with and a little box that's hidden away underneath the table that take all the mics in and convert it to digital and then that goes off to a DSP that's in the rack as well. This does make the equipment last longer. I have an install out there where we did this with the old analog cables 12 years ago, 13 years ago, and it's still running. I went there about six months ago. It was still running and it was still running code from 2012. And it was still all functional because it was all tucked away, out of the way, the very little maintenance on it was incredible to see actually, because the matrix switch took up a full room high rack all on its own. It was all individually switched, red, green and blue, H and V, VGA, um, matrix switcher from Extron. It was incredible. So, so that's what's been going on over the years. Um, so now I'll move on to um, what I've mainly been talking about this week with all the, um, the Crestron program is, is what is the future for Crestron? Um, they're moving to a full C-sharp, proper C-sharp, not the visual, not the compact framework 3.5. Um, it's actually now um, .NET Framework version 4.7. Um, they are looking at updating that. Uh, they do tend to move a lot slower than a lot of other um, people like Microsoft and Google. Um, number one, they're a lot smaller. Number two, like I said before, their kit is running stuff that is 24-7, 365, and some of it's been running for eight, nine, ten years without any maintenance or update. So they have to be very careful when they do an update that it's not going to break stuff and it is going to be stable and run properly. Um, sadly, they're still not completely open. There are NuGet packages, but you have to know where to get them. And knowing where to get them is sadly still locked down. I have asked them about opening it up. Um, they still want to do some training and some form of certification. Um, they are currently working on it. If people do want to have a look at it, I sort of can, but shouldn't. Um, let you know, but again, you need a controller to um, write this stuff for. But um, it's an interesting move for them. Um, and like I say, they're, they're still working out what they're doing with it and how much they're going to give out. They, they do keep saying, you know, you can bring in a C-sharp programmer and they'll know what to do. Uh, no, they won't because they don't know how to integrate the Crestron DLLs, they don't know the, you know all the stuff I've been talking about tonight, how you control the displays and how you make all the systems work together in an AV world. Um, and they've done the same thing with the UI, so they're moving to what they call CH5, Crestron HTML5, um, which is at its most basic a JavaScript com library which gives you the hooks to then talk in what they call their basic try list, so digitals, numerics, and strings into their control systems from a standard HTML5 code UI. Um, their touch panels tend to run as um, single page applications because um, obviously they are 
just a touch panel that sat on a table. You don't really want scrolling on it because people aren't going to know to do that. Um, although you probably could. Um, but the single page application allows it to very quickly switch between all the different pages for all the different control things that you need. Um, they do say you can use any IDE you like to develop it. They're, they're mainly concentrated on VS Code. They've got an extension in VS Code that lets you have the, um, uh, whatever it's called, you know, you type a little bit and it gives you the rest of it. IntelliSense. Um, and it does work with the frameworks. Um, Angular, it definitely works with, they've done an example project in it. React, you have to do a little bit of juggling to get it to work. Um, but it does work with Vue as well, apparently. I'm not really up on any of the frameworks, but apparently it can work with any of those. Um, although at the moment, I should find out more next week because I'm on that class. Um, it only works on their latest touch panels. Um, there is no browser or tablet support for their HTML5 solution at the moment. Um, their old way of doing it, they have an iPad app. You can use a browser, it uses Flash. Um, but at the time they developed it, Flash was the, the go-to. Um, the nice, one of their stop gaps is they've got an Adobe Air solution that runs as an executable on the desktop. So you can use that instead of the browser Flash version for the time being. Um, but they're struggling to get the um, the HTML5 stuff to work in a browser because they because of the all the JavaScript stuff and their transport protocol that they're doing all in the background because it's all secure and it's their own protocol. They're doing something in the firmware for their touch panels, which is why it works on there. Um, So yeah, that's it for them. And looking into that, the things I've discovered recently, uh, there's more to UIUX design than putting buttons on pages. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I you know, the industry is very out of date, slow, no new ideas really coming in. Um, because people who do AV programming tend to come into it through other AV programmers and it's always been done that way and to learn you take their stuff and modify it a little bit. Um, I've only ever in my 17 years involved with AV, I've only ever seen user testing on a design before it got deployed once in the many, many hundreds of systems I've done. And that design was seven years ago and it's still in use today and everybody loves it and it works. Um, the nice thing was um, I did London, then I rolled it into a demo room in their headquarters in Connecticut over a weekend. Um, we just updated the system from their old crappy one to a new one over a weekend. I walked in on the Monday morning, some people were using the room. I went, you need any help? They went, no, we're fine. We've got everything running. That's when you know you've got it right. Um, the AV industry does need to modernize its programmer community. Um, we are mostly people who've come into it from the install world. So I started off um, as a service engineer. I'd go in and they'd go, oh, the AMX touch panel isn't working. What can we do? What can we do? Uh, well, it's not plugged into the network. And they go, oh, we've got a bug. This button isn't doing anything. And then I'd call up the programmer on the mobile phone and there was no team viewer. There's no remote desktop then. So I had to have the code open on my laptop and then on the phone with the program, we go, go to line such and such and change this word and then compile and upload it. Um, and I had that job because I was good with computers. Not that I'd done computer science at school or anything like that, 
I've done a bit of C programming, but that was mainly for my um, electronic engineering rather than computer programming. So there are a few people who've come into it from a computer programming background, but not that many. It tends to be you're an installer, you're good with computers, go and learn Crestron programming or go and learn AMX programming. Um, and so you're learning from Crestron and AMX, you're not learning from a, a programming community. Um, there does need to be more liaison with schools and colleges um, and Avixa and CD are working on that. Um, I, you know, my son does computer science at school. They've never heard of this industry, but they've got an Extron control system controlling the projector in the classroom, but they don't know about this world. Um, <laughs> um, there is no path into the industry. Like I said, everything is locked down. You need a login. You need to go and do their training first before you get hold of the software. Before you get hold of the software. Um, you know, I can't release software to people because of the agreement I have with, with the, the, the dealers, with the, with the manufacturers. Uh, it's locked down. Um, the only way I can release software is if I employ someone to and release it to them, but you can't employ someone who doesn't know the pro. You know, the, the, it's a chicken and egg. You can't get programmers developed because they can't get access to the software. They can't get access to the software. The, the, yeah. Um, I say at the bottom, you don't go into AV programming as a career. I fell into it. I was around the industry. I was good with computers and they sent me on the classes and I fell into doing it. Um, I was lucky to have a very good mentor. Um, he was the programmer I was on the phone to as a commissioning engineer. Um, he said I was the only one who could keep up with him um, when he was saying about, and I was ahead of him, but some, sometimes I go, oh yeah, this, this number's wrong. You need to change it. Um, so when it came to a point where I was going around working for an installation company and they ran into financial trouble, stopped paying the wages, and I went, no. He went, go freelance, I'll send you work. And that's how I became an AV programmer. It wasn't planned, it wasn't, um, you know, part of a development or a career. I didn't go as a junior. It was, it was more a case of diving at the deep end and go and do it. Um, the week after I called him, I was at a house in Marbella working on a 15 room system. <laughs> yeah, quite nice. Again, he'd, he'd written all the code and done all the UI. It was a case of deploying that, looking at bug fixes. Well, a lot of what I'd been doing over the years as a commissioning engineer anyway. So it's, it's sort of a, a nice little build up to it. And the nice thing was he'd do the code, I'd go and deploy it, debug it. And then I learned that way, rather than actually being chucked in at the deep end and told, write code from scratch for this system. So it is a sort of mentor -y type thing. Um, that's about it, really. Talked for a lot longer than I thought I would. Um, yeah, questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Neil. That was really interesting. Uh, we, we don't have any questions in the chat, but if anyone wants to jump on the um, audio and, and, and pop off some questions, feel free to jump in. There's, there's um, not so many that will have such a, a rush, I imagine, but I've got a few questions if um, no one else is forthcoming. Um, in fact, I've got quite a few questions, if I'm honest. I filled a whole notebook up here. Well, far away. <laughs> I'm, I'm finding this all very fascinating. And a lot of the things that you said really, I don't know. I, yeah, like some, some of the things you said have actually resonated with me in doing like UI stuff on the web. But other parts of it are just completely alien, particularly around what you're saying, like the chicken and egg situation with getting access to the software and access to things and you, you're like well if you can't access the software how do you learn it and how do you get a job if you don't know it and how do you how learn do you it if you can't get access to that job and it's yeah. like how does that work and um well like i say that the main way into it uh, up till now has been yeah. you work in the industry as as uh, it's mainly commissioning engineers so you'd go to site 
and set all the kit up and load the code for the right. programmer. Right. Um, and then you'd be like, so who wrote this code with all these bugs in yeah, it? So that, that, that then, <laughs> if, if you work for a decent company, gets you yeah. onto the training classes. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Certainly the, the lower end ones, and you get access to the software because you're working for a, an authorized company, if you like, that have a login that get you access to the software. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you can work from it from there. But you sort right. of, in some ways, you have to be in the industry to be in the industry. Yeah, because you need to work <laughs> for a company already that can give you that access without violating the license. Yeah, basically. yeah. And, um, you and, and you can't go, you can't go in as a programmer. You ha you have to go in as something else and become. Right. A programmer. Yeah, you have to notice that they also do that and say, "Hang on, I'm like, can I, yeah. <laughs> can I do that?" Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's but, interesting. Uh, that's the sort of nice way that Crestron are heading with their C sharp. It is C sharp. Yeah. And HTML5. Yeah. Yes, they have their own little peculiarities. Yeah. Um, but suddenly there's millions suddenly more. It opens it up. Yeah. I have I there's a really nice um avnation.tv. If you have a look at avnation.tv, right. um there's a control systems um programming podcast oh really I've just done one on the html um side of things and mm. there's a really interesting discussion between a german programmer and a uk programmer yeah about working with html web devs working with right. web devs yeah and, and a lot of it is they don't understand our world Right. I had to spend, you know, what I'm saying, I had to spend hours explaining to them our world mm -hmm. so that they could then develop the UI to use. Yeah, yeah. Because they didn't understand. Yeah, yeah. No, no it's, it's interesting because you say that, like things like, you know, you were saying, like, oh, you don't generally have scrolling interfaces because, yeah. like, like, you know, whereas the, on the web, like, generally you do. So there's certain, it's the same, but in, like, in some strange ways, they're actually polar opposites in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Whereas a web dev would be like, oh, we'll just stick another one at the bottom of the list and just scroll up. <laughs> be like, no, no, this is a fixed interface. This is, it all needs to appear on this one we, screen. We have enough trouble with end users mm. touching a button that says laptop to put mm. the laptop on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Give yeah. them scrolling, they're, they're, they'll lose their minds. They're, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's, true. it's not visible. Well, how would you know unless there's some way to know yeah. that you can do that? Yeah, yeah. No, you're not, you're not, a lot of the time, you're not dealing with stupid people either. These no, are of course not. university professors. Yeah. Um, scientists. I did one, a really, really big one for um, cancer research company. Mm. And these, these are really intelligent people. Yeah, and they can't work out that they're, they're scared of it. Right, right, yeah. And is that and is that their, is that their fault or the UI developers' fault? And that's what it comes well, down. I think to, it was it? more of at the time it was more of a touchscreen thing. This this was the days before the iPhone came out. Yeah, okay. So it was unfamiliar. It was it, it was unknown. Touchscreen was an unfamiliar thing to them, and they were scared of it. Yeah. Whereas no. now, the the sort of younger generation, they walk in a room, see a screen that says touchscreen to start, and they go. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, just touch it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. What do I do? Laptop, laptop, laptop. Yeah, they're used to it. They're used to that they're kind of intuitive, it. like yeah. predictability of the UI. And as long as you can achieve that with a button that says laptop, you hope yeah. that it's okay. Why, why, yeah. why do you think the industry has been so restricted for such a long time in that way? And why has it been so locked down? And do they see that as a benefit to them in the sense that they keep to keep control of what's going on? Or are they now slowly realizing that actually opening it up to more people would be beneficial because more people can program for their kit? And are they wanting to lock it down and become make it so that you have to be authorized in order to like make it so, because if they're installing hardware in someone's house or in their office or boardroom or whatever, it's got their name on it and their logo. And if someone who's not good enough to build for that and doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't understand the different paradigm, is yeah. that why they're locking it down? Because they want some quality control on the on the hardware. They do want a bit of quality control on it. Yes, that, yeah. that actually came up today in in the lecture we were having today on for the Crestron Masters. Yeah, it was a um, 
whose name's on the touch panel. Right. If yeah. something doesn't work, who are they going to Who do they ring? With? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as in that, from that perspective, it's really under, quite understandable. Yeah. So I guess it's a kind of a case of kind of bridging those two worlds of the web where it's just like free for all. Anyone can do whatever they want because <laughs> it's just someone's computer and no one's no computer manufacturer ever gets the blame for some third party website someone's made. Yeah. Whereas in this case, who gets the call? Yeah, that's, that's, so in that sense, it makes sense, I guess. You don't blame the browser, you blame the website. Precisely, yeah. Whereas in this case, it's the absolute it's opposite. The, the code. It, it, yeah, it's the yeah. name that's in front of them. Yeah. On the bottom of the touch yeah. I mean, it's understandable they want to protect their, it's kind of reputational defense in a way, isn't it? Making sure you know that the people you let build. Are the annoying thing is, even though they've done all this lockdown, mm. there's still bad programmers out there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, that's interesting. What is the, what do you have to do to be authorized? Uh, you just have to work through their training. So right. Um, so on the Crestron side, they've got what they call like 101, 201, 301. Yeah. Where you build up the programming like simple windows and the mm -hmm. simple bus stuff um, and then you have to do a test which has changed quite a lot i mean um, they did a special one for a group of us in the uk mm. um, it's a weird thing because i had access to the software because yeah. i worked for a company i'd got access and i'd left and gone freelance but i still kept the access yeah. <laughs> um, so I was what was called a rogue programmer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd done the training. I'd done the 101, 201, 301. So I'd done all the training. Mm. I just hadn't done the exam, the certification exam. Right. Um, so what they did was it was UK only and it was only about 15 of us who'd all done the training and were doing programming but weren't certified. And they did a one week blitz, if you like, where we went into their office and worked through all the stuff with the instructor and um, got certified that way. Right, right. And what they do tend to do is, is send you uh, an exam and then you work through it at your own pace, but people are saying it takes two or three months, about 70 hours of work to produce wow. something for their, for their yeah. to get you certified. Wow, um, so it's not, a, it's not a trivial task really to get off. There is a lot to learn from. Yeah, you know, especially on the Crestron side, you saw the simple Windows software. There is a lot to learn from that point of view that's not actual programming as such. Mm. It's more building a system up from the box. Um, and, you know, the UI software is quite difficult to learn as well. Mm. Um, with how it's all put together and putting together a proper working system. Yeah. Um, but... The annoying thing is a, a lot of um, dealers out, people become a dealer because you get access to the software without having mm. to be certified. Okay. And you can program systems without having to be certified because you're a dealer. Right. And they get around it that way. Yeah. They sell like one or two bits of equipment a year, but the main business is programming. Yeah. Whereas um, Crestron have a, a program called CSP, Crestron Service Provider which is a thousand dollars a year. You pay them a thousand dollars a year mm. as a certified programmer. And then you can go and sell your programming services into the um, AV installer company. Oh, right. Yeah. Only the very biggest AV installers have their own programmers on staff. A lot of them just bring in a freelancer, yeah. CSP, or um, there are the odd little programming houses, which tend to be set up as partnerships rather than full on, companies if you like development houses um but they're they're sort of very few and far between most of it is people like i was um one man band go and program systems and you tend not to see other programs yeah yeah that's yeah so which is it just adds to the difficulty of getting into the world i suppose if you're often yeah. working alone then it's harder to collaborate and communicate about what you're learning yeah. and yeah. The difficulty as well is, is learning new stuff because because yeah. you don't get to talk to other programs yeah the yeah. nice thing that's come up over the last few years is the online communities like forums discord yeah. there's a discord server there's a oh, nice yeah so you can really start sharing knowledge now yes mm. and nice. a few forums and a lot of us are now sharing things on there and chatting on there it's it's a, it's improved a lot over the last few years yeah that's fascinating it's a fascinating world it really is 
Um, mm. did, did, did anyone else have any questions they wanted to ask or sh should I carry on? Because I've got a page for it. <laughs> you asked by anyone which uh, it was with regard to the um, wine, basically, um, and answering basically their, their brand term or their, their, their logo is on your work. Um, it's a very good answer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, they are the, um, the manufacturers are the ones who get called when the client gets really, really pissed off with the AV company. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, it wasn't us, it was that hack programmer you employed who didn't have our certification. <laughs> well, it's like that one, um, you know, I said about they, they, they flew me over to Connecticut to program a room over a weekend. Yeah. Um, after I'd done London, that room was supposed to be the template that we used in London. Right. I was involved doing the London side of it, but the American programmer was supposed to do that as their as their sort of global standard. Right. And they completely screwed it up. They went through ah. three programmers. They completely screwed it up. It was horrible. Um, so they brought me in because I was doing London anyway. I put a UI design together. Um, they really liked it. Went into the London office. We did the user testing. It went down really well with the users that we had. We deployed it in London. They loved it. And then they flew me over to New York. And like I say, over a weekend, they were having all sorts of problems and bugs and not things not working and mm. you know, audio coming out on the tray floor that shouldn't have been coming out on the tray floor. Oh, no. <laughs> and um, I reprogrammed it over a weekend and they had no problem since. Oh, nice. Well, there you go. And it, it, like I said, we didn't change any wiring, so they'd installed yeah. it properly. It was the program. Yeah. Yeah. So well, did they, were they certified, those programmers who messed it up? Or? Apparently, yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, it's not a, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it's. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, when I was a rogue programmer, if you like, I was. Yeah. Um, bought in by some companies because the, the supposed gold level programmer mm. um, from Crestron had screwed it up and couldn't do right. the job. Gold level, I like that. Gold level. <laughs> well, I've, I've got my silver exam to take. So what happens is you become certified right, right. in Crestron land mm. and then you can go to what's called Crestron Masters every year. And you have to do three of those. You have to actually attend three of those to right. then get your silver exam. And then you have to do your silver exam and get it passed. Right. Silver. And then another three. And then you do gold, another yeah. three, diamond or platinum. And then, another and, then and then you get sent out to Connecticut, Connecticut to mess up a installation. <laughs> <laughs> Joyous. Sounds brilliant. Sounds brilliant. But, um, but yeah, the, the, levels try, are more, so. the levels are more a case of I've been doing this for many years rather than an actual measure of your competency. Yeah, well, so hey, that's the same certain, in Webland. <laughs> yeah, you have to have a certain amount of competency to be able to get through the test anyway. Yeah, so at least there's that. There's, yeah. there's at least that. <laughs> uh, hey, Simon, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, well, I was just following the conversation. Was, uh, um, I used to work at a company called Enlight, which I think more don't know about. Uh, in Loddon, where, where we were doing uh, street lighting, uh, connected street lighting. And um, right. I concur with Neil, it's, it, it's, it's very much a, a different uh, mindset um, from the programming side of things, is that where you're doing a website, um, it, it's fairly formulaic um, for the most part. Um, but yeah, when you're dealing with real devices that are out there and, and the the flows of information and stuff. That's that's quite a different thing. I, I don't know if you've found that at all yourself, Neil. Yes, very much so. You, you know, the, probably 50% of the work you do is interpreting the protocol documents that the manufacturers, you get from the manufacturers. Um, some are really easy, some are really hard. I mean, I, it took me half an hour once to work out how to switch on a Sony projector. <laughs> because their protocol document was like 500 pages oh, wow. and it, go, it went really deep into you know why you have to do it that way and all the timings and all that stuff all I really wanted to go was power on carriage return <laughs> yeah 
Mm -hmm. I was lucky in like they, they built everything themselves. They weren't connecting to any third party devices at the time that I was there. Um, so I had direct access to the guy who, who ran the, or had created the cluster controller and in fact was able to then work on, you know, actually if you did it this way, they all gave me this bit of information then I could do X, Y, and Z on the, on the front end and stuff. So yeah, it was a, a diff slightly different from what you're encountering, I guess. But, um, the other thing I was going to ask was, um, do you have uh, customers who say, can I add this Roomba or whatever into my, my front end? I want to be able to control X, Y, Z as well. Um, do you get that a lot? Um, not so much. Um, but there's a house I did in Athens where we had to add in the security system. Um, so you wanted to know, you know, are all the windows shut and all? Mm. We also added the weather in the um, HVAC system. It was probably the most connected house I've ever done. Um, right, yeah. They had dehumidifiers in the living room because there was a swimming pool in the living room. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, sort of stuff. I've never really had the, um, oh, can we add this in? Um, it's always, main, well, mostly been planned ahead. Um, I do get the odd thing from the commercial world that sort of, you know, you get the IT director come at the end and he goes, oh, yeah. oh, we told the salesman at the beginning we wanted to do this. Can we do this? And it's like half past five on a Friday night and you want to go home. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, we can. I wish I'd known like eight hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like the web world. No, no, no. That's very familiar. Yeah, that does. The people in the AV industry, you know, you are working on site at half eight, nine o'clock at night. You're the last people off because you're waiting for the builders to build the wall that you put the telly on. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been on, I've been on building sites that, uh, you know, have been like bare concrete floor and people are, are spraying paint on the windows and we've been trying to install the AV system because the client wants it installed at that time. Mm. I, I can imagine you kind of straddle the whole thing because I guess you want wiring inside the walls before they're all sealed up and plastered over but then you need the finished thing to put the, to put the speakers up <laughs> and put the TV up and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah but I can't do my job until that's all done. Right yeah sure. Sure. Yeah. So because you're doing the software side of things, you're kind of just like, well, all right, the cables are there, but none of the equipment's working. So there's not much to do. I'm, I'm, I got told by a project manager to go to site once and I rolled up to site, um, opened the door of the comms room and all the kit was in boxes in the corner of the comms room and not a single cable had been run on site. Oh, so you cracked open a beer and said, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> I can't do anything. Um, but no, the nice thing was, I, because I'd come from the installed commissioning side, I went over all the drawings with the, with the engineers um, who were going to be doing it. I fixed all the problems that the systems designer hadn't noticed. <laughs> um, and so, oh, it doesn't work this way, you have to do it this way and all that stuff. So we actually got it all wired up and running nicely. So that ended up making your job easier when you got to actually do yeah, it. You had a do chance it about to three lay the ground. Later, yeah. <laughs> Um, the other one, another one was we, I showed up on site, it was still a building site, um, but they were pushing for getting all the AV kit up. Um, and the commissioning engineer didn't have what they call the CSCS card, um, which is a card that gets you on to building sites. And I can see Simon knows what that is. Um, that's changed a bit lately as well, but there, there, there's still a way through for it. Um, and I, I, as the programmer, had one but the commissioning engineer didn't. So he was relegated to the comms room and, and the build room and, uh, and the sort of cafeteria bit. And I was the one who had to go out on site and do all his jobs. But again, they were saying, oh, why isn't this screen installed? And I was saying, well, the wall's not built yet. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a, a wooden partition wall that they had to build. I mean, honestly, this sounds very familiar to yeah. the web development world where we're like, oh yeah, can we just see how like, you know, the like just you know just one page of the website before any of the foundations are built you know <laughs> yeah. sort of thing like can you just show us this one finished piece 
before you like, like, actually got a database to put the content in. <laughs> put all the screens up. Yeah. People put all the screens up. Uh, and then the painter comes along, gets behind it, knocks yeah. it yeah. with his roller. And it's like, oh, that's a £3,000 TV. Oh. It's, it's, well, it's certified for 24-7-365. TV <laughs> on a tray floor. Commercial yeah. screen. It's not like your normal resi 500 quid thing you pick up from Asda. Yeah. These are built and guaranteed for 24-7-365 operation. Yeah, but not for being on building sites whilst Not things are still under construction. Yeah. And dust and paint. Yeah. yeah, sounds 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 somewhat familiar, but yeah, also a bit ridiculous. You can but be then, you can you know, kind of see why people want it, I suppose. They want to see it yeah. all working. The nice thing with this world is, you know, like I said about one of the first jobs I did as a freelance programmer, I went to Marbella. Yeah. For, for two weeks. Nice. Got put up in a five star hotel. I mean, there are worse jobs for sure. You know, you spend spend eight, nine, ten, well, sometimes sixteen hours a day on site, but yeah, you know, eat at nice restaurants. So yeah, true. That enough. you don't have to pay for probably either. No, you don't pay for it. Yeah, the client pays for it. Yeah, hey, it could be worse. It could be worse. Yeah, and you know, trip to Dubai and Thailand and mm. Athens and Moscow. Mm. There's a, there's quite a lot of travelling involved with it. Not so much yeah. these days. It's it's going away slowly. Why, um, why is that? Because, um, well, originally you do it as the programmer. We're, we're talking to all these different devices. Yeah. And you have to go to site in order for the devices to be hooked up because you don't have them all in the lab at home. Mm -hmm. You have a touch panel on the processor, so all that bit you can do. Yeah. And like I said, with the QSC, you can run that as an emulator, so you can check all that out. Yeah, but, but it's an emulator. It's not the it's actual an emulator, thing. It's not the real thing. Yeah. Um, but displays, I mean, display manufacturers. Yeah, you know, people like um, Samsung and NEC, they, they're all right. They, they keep the same protocol throughout. Sharp, yeah. constantly changing. Philip, uh, constantly changing. <laughs> you know, so you have to go to site, or you used to have to go to site because there was no other way of doing it. Mm. Um, nowadays, the commissioning engineer has all the software on his laptop, and you run TeamViewer, right? You get internet access on site, yeah. and you TeamViewer into his laptop. Go, yeah. oh yeah, that's not working. That's because that protocol they've got an extra zero. Uh, just add that in, send in the code, gets uploaded, done. Yeah. So you, didn't, so you don't need to be there. There's I ways don't around it. Need to be there as much as I used to be. Yeah. Um, my role at the moment, though, is now more of a, although I do the back end commission, you know, the back end programming still, um, I'm more of a go on site and make sure the systems are functioning as they should, the mm -hmm. installers installed it properly. Yeah. Um, rather than actually testing and debugging code while I'm on site, I'm doing more of the, you know, is the room functioning correctly? The more there's, from the consultant, because there's AV consultancy people who, who mm. you know, put the, talk to the clients and put all the systems together, which then they hand off to the AV installers, which then buy all the hardware yeah. and wire it all up, and then the programmers make it all work, mm. um, or the commissioning engineers. Um, the company I work for bridge the consultancy world and the programming world and just use the AV installer to install the kit. Mm. So they, they do the site wiring, they put the hardware in the rack to wire it all up, all that sort of stuff. And then I go and make it all work. Right. You then kind I of, I mean, you, you've got the it. high level picture of what it's supposed to do and you know which where the kind of tricky bits are and which bits to kind of poke and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. Sure. That sounds like a potential disaster if, uh, if they've wired it wrong. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's another nice but thing about- in the wrong room. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened yeah. yeah yeah i can imagine and they're like they're like it's on your plan here <laughs> it's your fault yeah um that is, it's happened that they wired things up wrong and and that's you know the other nice thing about me coming from the the service commissioning world is i know when they've wired it wrong and i can go and rewire it if i need to or i can tell them what to do yeah that's so, useful one of the biggest things was the difference between balanced and unbalanced audio. Oh, right. 
Can, can you explain that to us briefly? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that. So balanced audio means that you have one wire with a positive phase signal on, another okay. wire with a negative phase signal on, and a ground. Right. Unbalanced, you have one wire with a signal on. Yeah. And what happens is if you, if you wire the balance, if balanced into a balanced, the balanced input takes the phases mm. and sort of subtracts them, if you like. Right. And that gives you the audio signal without any of the noise because the noise gets added to both signals at the same. Right. So if you, yeah, you sort of put them out of phase and subtract them. Okay. Um, so what happens is if you've got a sine wave like that and it does that on the other one, mm -hmm. you do a comparator and it takes the difference. So you then end up with a nice sine wave. If there's right. noise put onto the signal, it gets put onto both of them exactly the same. Right. So if you subtract then it the, the, the noise cancels itself out. Yeah, yeah. So Whereas I, on when, the, you say, when you say put noise on the signal, what what do you mean put noise? Well if you're on? running say you're running it near a um power line mm -hmm. and the fridge switch is on and off, you get a little spike on the power line. Okay. It puts a spike it, inducts a spike across on the okay so it's it's like it's making sure that those different like those fluctuations are present in both cases such that you can on do on them both, it, it's, the it's the end. same on both wires and what yeah. happens at the comparator end mm -hmm. is that that because it gets some sort of subtracted yeah out of phase if you like it cancels that signal out because it's yeah. the same on both wires yeah whereas right. the signal itself is complete opposite on each one yeah Huh, interesting. But what happens if you take a, a stereo signal, so you've got left and right, yeah, and you put the left one into the plus and the right one into the minus, <laughs> what happens? They cancel each other out, I suppose. Each other out, you get yeah. no sound. <laughs> you get, and then you're like, why isn't it working? I can hear some like vague hiss, but nothing else. You, yeah, if you put music through it, what you do get is almost like a karaoke backing track. Right, yeah, yeah, because you've like cancelled out any instrument that's in both channels. Because, yeah, <laughs> because the, the vocal is the same on both channels. Yeah, yeah. But part of how the music's recorded is the instruments tend to be more of a spread and across. Out. Yeah. And it's slightly different on both channels to sort yeah. of spread it out. That's how surround sound works. Yeah, yeah, so anything that's going down the centre just disappears. And yeah. all you can hear is like the supplemental stuff on the edges. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And I walk into a room and I plug my laptop in and play some music and you can't yeah. hear the vocal. Yeah. And you're like, huh, what could well, that? I'd left and right into plus and minus again, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. And they go, oh, and they go and rewire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's. But that, yeah, that's, that's not really part of being an AV programmer. That's more the commissioning side of it. Yeah, that's so just understanding how the technology works, basically. <laughs> you, as an AV programmer, you do tend to be the most intelligent person inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially if you've come up from that, that kind of physical installation the, point from, of view, yeah. you understand how it works, and now... You've got the yeah. experience behind you. Yeah, yeah. To do it. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do also tend to be the most intelligent person. <laughs> so can... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so so there's, there was one other thing I really wanted to ask you about. When you say a system's been running for eight or nine years without any updates, and after talking about the Mr. Robot scene with the hacked <laughs> software house, it is old software, like an old, like obviously a system that's been running flawlessly for 10 years is... is you know working really well an exemplary example of what you should do but yeah is, is there increasingly a concern about not being able to leave them for that period of time without upgrades and updates and security concerns yeah it's a bit more than it used to be i mean that system although it was slightly networked it wasn't mm. um and how do they protect them from the public internet they, are they tend are they connected? to not be on the public internet. Yeah. They tend to be. Yeah, but does but, someone say, like, oh, I want to be able to do it on my phone. I want to turn everything on when I get home, when I'm yeah. in the car on the way home. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can do that with the newer systems. Um, you could do it for the older ones. It was a bit more difficult, but it could still be done. Yeah. Um, 
but up until probably about five years ago, IT wouldn't let us anywhere near the network. Yeah. Um, we'd be dealing with facilities. We wouldn't be dealing with IT. We'd be dealing with facilities. Mm. Yeah, ten, five, ten years ago. Um, and IT wouldn't even be consulted. So we'd come in and we'd basically, there'd be a network switch in the rack that would be ours. It wouldn't be connected to their main network. It wouldn't be connected to the internet. Right. So there wasn't the security concern. Yeah, fair um, enough. I mean, the Wi Fi's were even left open for a lot of the, where they had right. wireless panels. Because it's basically it's just, just open the, network. As long as you're like in that vicinity, there's. Yeah. That's just, the only place. Well, Sometimes people would hide the SSID, but a lot of the times. Yeah. yeah. But well, if, if you're a billionaire, you've probably got a bit of space around you anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, well, that was mainly offices, but right, um, yeah. houses you did tend to set on sit on their Wi-Fi because the the owner wanted to use his iPad to control the system. So right, yeah, more yeah. Interface. And there wasn't that IT department between you and the network. Right, so you could just do whatever um, you want, basically. <laughs> that's why a lot of the home install AV companies are actually AV stroke IT. They do the network and the AV. Yeah. Um, it's sort of integrated that way because the homeowner just wants to deal with one technology company. They don't. Yeah, to. that's fair, fair. And they, they, if, even if they've got a Wi-Fi from their ISP, they don't have it set up with the routing that they need for all this stuff. Yeah. No. And then a lot of the AV, you know, AV IT companies come in. They they put a route. They switch the. Uh, like the Virgin Media Hub or BT Hub into modem mode, mm. plug a, a, a semi-pro router in or a pro router, yeah, and and firewall systems and things like that mm. um, into it so that um, they can then manage the network properly. Yeah, and so we're we're putting in Monaco, we are putting enterprise grade network kit into this guy's house. Yeah, Cisco full-on proper Cisco network <laughs> into his house. I mean, if you've got the money, why not, I suppose? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a big house. Yeah. <laughs> um, ah, it's amazing. And this guy, this, this person's got more than one house all over the world. Yeah. With that sort of setup in. Worth about four billion, something like that. Nice. So, well, I mean, you um, would, right, I suppose. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you get to meet these people. They're a bit peculiar. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, now with, um, as I was saying about the security side of things, mm. um, yeah, about, about five, six years ago, it started moving into the world of the IT. So it mo the AV side of things moved away from facilities and into the IT department. Yeah. Um, so then we started going onto the network with network displays and DS. It started off with video conferencing, so the video conferencing moved away from being RS-232 controlled to IP controlled, and then we moved on to the displays and the, um, everything else. Mm. Um, and now pretty much everything is on the network. Um, there's very few devices now that are, that are RS-232 or IR controlled. Mm. Um, Apple TV is still one of them. IR controlled, mainly. Really? Yeah. Um, that is interesting. But they hadn't opened up the protocol. Right. To the secret protocol. And what now we just secret? started to go into the home kit control. Hmm. What um, was secret? The Apple protocol or the, the Apple protocol for controlling the Apple TV over IP. Right, right. Yeah. Typical Apple. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's that's yeah. I think it's fascinating. It's a fascinating world. Like you say, it's like you 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 said you kind of fell into it, and I it, I can see how that's the case because like you say it's really hard to kind of even know that this is a world that exists in many ways yeah well people tend not to think about it either like i say the no. computer science class at my son's school yeah have no got idea. a control system in the classroom and yet they <laughs> yeah. don't you know somebody had to go in and program that yeah yeah but they've got no idea what it is or how it works or anything about it really and yeah. like even though it's right there and they could maybe use it for the one of their lessons or something like yeah they just don't know. Yeah. Mad. Yeah, it's an exciting world. It is an exciting world. Yeah. Yep. Fascinating. It's fun. Well, it was fun. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything gets old after a while, I suppose. But um, yeah, especially. Yeah, the, the, it comes cookie cutter after a while. 
Yeah. You've got a display, you've got some form of video stroke audio switching. Yeah. If you're lucky, you've got video and audio conferencing to play with. But yeah. You know, there, there's three or four systems out there. Once you've done them, you've done them, you just drop the code into your new program and away you go. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, that's in a way, that's what you want, I suppose. You want it to be nice and reliable and time tested and, and yeah. And then, you know, from, from the UI side, change the logo on the touchpad. Yeah. <laughs> if you're being a little bit pedantic, if the marketing department's being a little bit pedantic, you change some of the colours. Right, yeah. They're like, we want it to be on brand. It's got yeah. to be on brand, yeah. It's yeah. on brand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, make, the back, make the background green. We don't want the background blue. Blue's not our colour. We want it green. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, that's all right. We thought of this. We can and just we want make it, this we want it here. This and green. Be... <laughs> yeah. They are like that. We want it this green. This green, yeah, yeah. That's our brand. Green. Tone, you know, yeah. You're like, but none of the text is visible on that color green. It's like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's got to be that green. Yeah, it's our green. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. So there's, yeah, and and things moving into the more kind of web tech land is a recent thing. Yeah, yeah. very much so. Yeah. And it seems to be only crush from moving that way at the moment. Right. And do you think that's because they've spotted that it makes sense for them to open it up to technologies that millions of more people are familiar with or well, saves them work as well? That's what they say. I get the feeling that they're getting pissed off with programmers moaning about their software. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like too they keep much saying, they're, they're a hardware manufacturer. They, they, they're not a yeah. software. Yeah, it's easier for them to build an extension for VS Code than it is to build VS Code basically from scratch. Yeah, which is effectively what their VT Pro is. It's yeah, it's almost like VS Code with a WYSIWYG front end sort of thing. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, take Adobe XD, mix it in with VS Code. Yeah, and you know that's the sort of stuff they're doing. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense, I suppose. Yeah. Which is why I asked on the group about a WYSIWYG editor that creates HTML. And yeah, so that, and I see why you would ask that now. Yeah, and everyone was just like, "Well, you know, we kind of don't have that in Webland, weirdly." And then you like you look at game developers using Unity or something, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I can just have this animated water. I just drag and drop it, and now there's a lake." Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, wow! And I can't even get a button to play to display on the screen reliably <laughs> across device without a load yeah. of work, you know? Well, I, you know, it, it took me a week to get Crestron's HTML5 and pummel it into some form of, yeah. oh, I can move the icon now around inside <laughs> the button, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, through their pre-built component. Yeah, you can make it at the top, but it's like really small. Yeah. And I'll make it bigger. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you have to override the CSS that they're using in their theme. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And it's stuff like, I wrestled that with that for weeks. But yeah. Um, not knowing HTML and CSS before I started doing that. Didn't yeah. And so then you're not even sure where the boundary is between HTML and CSS and what they've provided for you to use and where, like, all yeah, that I seem to have got my head around it better than most. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's, yeah, that's why you're where you are. Judging from, judging from some of the people. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll find out next week because they, they, their HTML class is next week. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, so you're doing that this week, like looking at all their new stuff. We've, we've been doing C Sharp this week, hmm. um, which has been interesting as well, because a lot of them couldn't even get Visual Studio 2019 to open. Um, uh, so it's going to be interesting next week to see how people have got on with the HTML and see if it's any better. Yeah. So some people are going to be like, oh, yeah, well, I was struggling with, this, with the particulars of the UI, and others are going to be like, yeah, it doesn't even, can't even turn it on, basically. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they can't even. You know, a lot of them struggle to log into their laptop. Uh, it's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes I feel like I'm dealing with people like that. But then, you know, to people like you who've been developing HTML5 or C Sharp for years, you know, I I look like that to you. I don't know. In, in some ways. In many ways, I still feel like that after doing this stuff for years. You know, it's it's. Yeah. It's, I think that's, that's often the nature of development in a lot of cases where, you know, you, you often forgetting things so as quickly as you learn them. Yeah. 
so often you know although you have some experience you still need references and to look things up everywhere and it's impossible there's, to remember um, everything yeah and there's there's always the um the, the guy who knows everything yeah goes, well, and, and i go well i did it this way yeah and prefer perfectly legitimate way of doing it ish probably yeah um, maybe not best practice maybe you know not the good way of doing it but it worked yeah you don't want to do it like that <laughs> yeah. That was years ago. We did it this. We didn't even do it. We do it this way. Yeah. He was a. Like, you don't want to do it like that, and he sort of left it at that. All oh, right. It's just that's. Like, right. You're going to give me a solution or what? Yeah. Don't <laughs> like, well, tell me I can't do it that way and then not give me an alternative. No, no. You can't just go around saying that's wrong with no solution. Yeah. You know, that seems a bit unreasonable. But. Yeah. Especially if it works in the way you've done it. Like, if you're like, well, it works. And like, well, that's not best practice. Well, okay, tell me what best practice is next time. I'll do it that way. Like, it's not a big deal. Some guy wanted a big transparent button to go over the whole page on a, on a, on a single page application. Yeah. Um, and it was like, well, position absolute, top left. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what he went, he came back with. You shouldn't use position absolute. Oh, well, that's, that's un hilariously, that's an absolute position, which is often yeah. incorrect, right? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like if you're, if you're saying like, oh, you absolutely shouldn't do that, because yeah. there are, there are definitely legit use cases for that, that, that particular thing. And at the end of the day, he did say, oh, yeah, that is probably, <laughs> probably how you do it. Like, yeah, I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, how else yeah. would you do it? <laughs> Yeah. Top left, hundred V H, hundred V Y. You know. Pretty right. much, yeah. I mean, you've got position absolute, or you've got a position fixed. Which, if you're not scrolling, I guess pop, probably do fairly similar things in that context. But like, you know, one isn't a best practice over the other. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? People yeah. often get strong opinions about things um, and best practices when actually, if it works and doesn't cause a performance issue or something else, well, then yeah. it doesn't matter, really, well, does it? The other thing that came up was the the frameworks thing, you know, like Angular, React, Vue. Yeah. Um, and he's saying, you know, you really should use a framework, and it's like, right. why? Well, it's quicker. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm now doing HTML5. It, it's just HTML5. I'm using SAS instead of just straight CSS. But yeah. Um, because it's easier for embedding and mm -hmm. translating and shit makes it makes it easier for me to place the css in the right place yeah um and i'm writing the whole thing in just the plain html5 and and that yeah. Yeah. i'm not using any frameworks but once i've developed it i'm not going to change it no if it works why would you if it works, right. i'll add extra buttons here and there I mean, they've, they've had the system running now for seven years. We've done changes and things over the years. Um, last, I added a button two years ago. Yeah. Because they, they started doing, um, like, web, you know, the Teamsy-based meetings. Mm. And they needed to put, dial a number and then put at TudorMeetings.com on the end of it. Or TudorMeetings.Webex.com on the end of it. Mm. Um, so rather than type that out every time they want a button that's just like one two three four actually the meetings dot webex dot com yeah Dial. yeah but you know i could easily add that into the html framework that i've got i had to put the button on like three pages right yeah so i'd have three places it would have the same css yeah yeah, and it's the structure of the page that you're on is the document anyway, so that it just makes sense. And I actually added it into what would be a blank space on the grid anyway. Oh, perfect. So there was just a spot right there for it. Yeah. There's a spot there for it anyway. But obviously in the WYSIWYG style thing that I had, it was just put a button in the blank space. Right, but yeah. What I've got now is um, done it in the HTML5, done the keypad in a grid, Mm. And there's a couple of blank grid spots. Mm -hmm. So I've just put it in one of those. Put it in there. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Often the simplest solutions are the are the ones that work for the longest, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you start using like the next the new fancy framework of the month, and then a year later, 
it's no longer in vogue and everyone's five moved years later else. come back to it five years later yeah exactly and you've just got a massive problem on your hands because everything's yeah. changed around you under your feet yeah. whereas html5 and css are going to work for a few years yet so it's probably <laughs> it's probably a much safer place to be yeah well the nice thing with the um the way they've gone with the c sharp and the new get packages it sort of brings all the packages into your solution folder so it's Mm -hmm. um, it's using the ones that you're using at that time. Okay, so as long so, as you've got a version that works. It's... As long as you've got an IDE that can work with that framework. Yeah. So the .NET framework 4.7. Yeah. As long as you've got the IDE that can open that. And you could keep a, a Visual Studio on a VM somewhere. Yeah. That could run that. Um, That's true. Keep the old versions around. It's no problem. Keep the old versions around. I've got... I've, I, I have actually have access to a version of Visual Studio 2008. Mm. The um, company I work for has got the MSDN subscription. Yeah. Um, and that's part of that. Um, so I can still do all the old stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, it's a fascinating world. It really is. Yeah. I say their, their hardware, you know, they last updated their controllers eight, nine years ago. Yeah. You see, you'd have to remember the .NET Compact Framework 3.5 when they actually started. Because don't forget the the development cycle before they even release it. Yeah, of course, yeah. As uh, well, the years before they release it, yeah. and they have to make sure it's rock solid. Yeah, it has to run 24/7/365. If it breaks, then they're the ones that get dragged in. Yeah, that's a completely different world, isn't it, to the web, where if something breaks, you can just update it tomorrow, and everyone immediately gets the new version. Like yeah. that's a completely different paradigm. Fascinating. Wow. Well, that was that was really interesting. Thank you for that, Neil. That was I actually really enjoyed that learning about this whole new world that is kind of tangential to what I do, but is also completely new and unrelated in in weird ways. That was really interesting. And, um, yeah. So thanks for that. I hope everyone um, enjoyed listening in. And um, yeah, I guess we'll uh, leave it there. Now we're getting on for nine o'clock. We've been going for a couple of hours now. So. Um, Thank you for having me. No, thanks for thanks for thanks for stopping by and, and yeah, sharing what you do with us. It's been really interesting. Thank yeah. You. Um Alex dropped off. He said he was having internet issues. I just had a message from him five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> but he oh, did man, today. He said, pass on my program. thanks to Neil. Um so thanks from Alex as well. Um right. and thanks to Stephen and Simon for sticking around right to the end. Um yeah. So hopefully that was, that was we, really interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Hopefully we, we will, used uh, oh, uh, Windows Compact Framework for doing some handheld scanning. Sorry, right, what's that? Then the software for some handheld scanning. Oh, you're oh, using yeah. Windows Compact Framework for hand. Sorry. You're building handhelds, you're doing Windows framework for handheld scanners, you say? Yeah. Wow. What do they that scan? That was about two years ago now. Yeah, yeah. What did they scan? The handheld uh, There's a warehouse oh. management system, so they scanned the barcode on the goods. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah, fascinating. Windows um, everywhere when you don't expect it. Yeah. We had to write all the menu system for the scanners, etc. Uh, okay, yeah. So you know what's going on basically with the device. Yeah. 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 Oh, fascinating stuff. That's probably a whole nother world that I don't know anything yeah. about as well. Well, the sort of industrial PLC yeah. programming as well. Yeah. Uh, the rabbit hole is deep. The rabbit hole goes on forever, doesn't it? <laughs> There's all sorts of things. All right. Well, hey, thank you all for um, yeah for coming along, and um, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. We're doing these fairly regularly now. I think the eleventh is next Thursday. The eleventh is the next one. Quite um, good. The diabetes one. Oh, and that one's I think that one's the twenty fifth, which is a couple of weeks later. Um, oh, and in diabetes. between there's the concurrent the go one with. Um, yeah. Satisfactory, go. Satisfactory, which is a game, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so that one might be fun as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll see you all next time. Um, 
thanks for stopping by again and um, have a good rest of your evening. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, folks. See you all. Bye-bye.